So you're thinking that you want to buy a piece of property in the foothills and mountains of Colorado, but you don't even know which questions to ask, where to get started. And this video is all about helping you understand what you need to know before you go living and moving and buying property up in the foothills and mountains of Colorado. So stay tuned. Hey, I'm Sean Murphy, the team leader of Moxie Denver at Keller Williams. I'm a realtor here in Colorado, and we love making videos about the pros and cons, cost of living, best neighborhood, uh, tips and tricks to living in our area. So subscribe and hit that bell so you're notified each time we put up that new hotness. All right, so I get calls all the time from people, especially out of state, that they say, I wanna live in the mountains. But they don't know anything about living in the mountains. So what do you need to know? The mountains are not for everyone and there are definitely a lot of levels to living in the Colorado mountains. The first thing we're gonna talk about is access. You'll be driving in the mountains and you're like, whoa, look at that awesome house. How do they get up there, right? In Colorado, we have all levels of, you're gonna have steep roads, unpaved roads, no roads privately maintained roads, publicly maintained roads. Roads that are paved, roads that you pay into an HOA to have maintained, roads you have to maintain yourself. I know it's hard if you're not from here to drive the roads, but especially if you're out here, uh, if the home looks too good to be true and the price looks amazing and the views are ridiculous, there's a good chance that it's super steep uh, to, to get to it or, or there's something something to know about the access to it. So you always want to check that. How long is your driveway? Is your driveway steep? Do you need to get a four-wheeler with a plow on the front of it? Always a good idea in the mountains too to have two trucks or two vehicles uh, with four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive because in case one gets stuck you have another to help get it out with or, or one breaks down. If you have a long driveway also that road is eventually going to need maintenance and if it's just a driveway through your property uh, you will be in charge of that so are you ready for that? Are you ready for that type of expense? If you're on an HOA road a lot of the times the further you get up the hill like a further along the road the higher you'll pay into the HOA because your you know daily drive is, is using up more of the road. Number two well in septic so if you're not used to a well they come in all shapes and sizes and if people are looking at land just just you know un developed land. I normally remind them that wells can cost about $10,000 per 100 feet and it's hard to know exactly how deep that water table is that you need to be tacked into uh, to hit your well. Also there's all kinds of different types of wells. It's kind of like a, a living organism that it needs maintained, it needs checked um, because that is your your life force, right? That's your, that's your water. And so not only do you want to make sure that you have a good pump rate and you can sustain your home, but you also want to check the quality. Some canyons will have lead, some will have radon in the water, and you need a special filtration system to get those out. And so important to know that with your well, you need to know how to maintain your well and how to change your filter so that you're always drinking quality water. The cool thing about our water is it's delicious. We're pretty much where the water comes off the snow melt. And so the water that you're getting has gone through less crap on its way to get to you. When you're testing and inspecting your home, make sure you get an inspector that's used to testing wells. If during your home inspection, you burn up the well pump because they're not getting enough water through it or whatever, um, you would be responsible for that. Basic well tests, quality tests are gonna uh, look for nitrates, bacteria, and what minerals are in your water. Beyond that, additional tests you could have done are for radiation in the water or just the, the water hardness. Keep in mind the average family uses about 200 gallons of water per day. And then with septic systems. So uh, septic systems have a couple different parts, typically the tank and the leach field where the biological waste will flow into. And those will always be checked before you purchase a home. Uh, in order to get a septic use permit, in order to use your septic system when you exchange ownership of a house, the seller of the house has to get this septic use permit, which means they have to have somebody come out to pump the tank. So it's nice because it's kind of like 
take your shit when you go type thing, get it out of here. But then when it's getting pumped, the technician will check it to make sure the seal in, in the, the vault is in good condition. Next, let's talk about topography and positioning of your house. So one thing that I see a lot when people are looking, they're like, hey, eight acres in the mountains. Oh my gosh. Well, look, because sometimes if it's too good, looks too good to be true, it's gonna be one acre down here where the house is at, and then seven acres that are straight up a hill, and it's basically unusable. A lot of websites will have the tool where you can see the topographical map, and so take advantage of that. Also, when looking at the positioning of the house, find out where it's sitting in relation to the sun. If you're on the north side of a steep cliff in the mountains, you might be a shadow all year round. <laughs> Maybe you catch a glimpse of some sun, but uh, yeah, that can make it extra cold in the winter if your house never gets any sun. And so south side of the mountain also has its challenges because if you're exposed to the south side the whole day, you're gonna be getting sun and it can get pretty hot, also cause you know wood damage sometimes to your floorboards if they're just getting direct sunlight all day or day. The nice thing about the landscape in Colorado though is uh, low maintenance in your yards. Typically, if you do have any flat land, um, you'll have a small area, maybe a fenced in area where you can let your pets out, things like that. Uh, but then for the most part, it's, you know, native plants and, and wild plants and trees and things like that. And so uh, typically low maintenance yards. Also your internet connection. People like areas like Evergreen, Conifer, Genesee, Morrison, because they're in the foothills, but they're close enough that you can commute to downtown. Usually the furthest I'll see people that wanna go is, is like Evergreen Conifer and still make it to wherever they need to be in the city within an hour. But if you're working from home and you think that the mountains is gonna be a perfect destination because you don't need to commute and so what if it snows you in, you'll just work from home all the time. Well, cool, but make sure you have good internet connection internet speed or you ain't gonna be getting nothing done nothing okay let's talk about the size of your lot i get a lot of people that want to move to the mountains because they want to get away from it all right they want peace they want quiet they want less traffic and i get all that uh but they'll ask me for like hey we want three acres and they're coming from kansas well uh really really hard sometimes to find three acres and gets pretty damn expensive. So I'll ask them, what do you want this land for? Were you planning on growing crops? Do you uh, plan on having animals? Like what's the game plan on it? They're like, yeah, you know, I just need some space. Is it because you want privacy? Because privacy, we can get you with trees. You won't feel like you have a neighbor right there. But if you want three plus acres, uh, I want to make sure you're aware of the budget for that because I don't want to set you up on a home search for three plus acres and you never find anything you want because you just want a little peace and quiet. But also you can find land that backs to green space or you know national forest or something like that. So have a small lot, but you're not gonna have any neighbors around you. Or the you're kind of at the top of a hill and it looks like a neighbor is close to you, but they're actually way far down the hill and you can't really see them and that you'd find that acceptable, right? So just something to keep in mind when looking and setting up properties. Typically with your property search, I kind of set it broad because I don't want to miss anything that might be a good fit for you um, without us looking at it a little further. The next thing is for you tiny home nation. I get it. Tiny homes are adorable. Uh, I went to a tiny home conference out in Portland one time and I found it's super interesting. I think I'm like an eight 800 square footer guy, so not like tiny home, but if I have a home in the mountains, uh, I think 800 is, is super comfortable. However, not to squash your dreams, but you have to abide by county building codes. And in order to stay on that property, you're gonna have to have some type of facilities, which means water source, and some type of septic in order for it to be inhabitable and for you to stay there. You're not allowed to just take a trailer up there, park there and live out of it. I know, I understand where your head's at, but it's not allowed, I'm sorry. The next thing to keep in mind is safety and pets. Uh, there are bears and coyotes and there are mountain lions and they would love to have a little puppy or a little kitty snack. So if you have a cat, 
it should it should be an inside cat for the most part or it will get snatched even dogs even if you have a big dog uh there are still bigger animals in the mountains that wouldn't make mind having your pup for a delicious afternoon snack and we don't want that we love our dogs and so you'll see a lot of folks that will have a a space a pen with high walls to try to keep anything from jumping in and getting their animal but bring them in at night and keep an eye on them during the day don't let them just wander the woods number seven home insurance there are some things with your topography and your access that will make your home more expensive for example if a fire truck if there's a fire the fire truck or ambulance can't get to your property well your insurance company is not going to like that and they're either going to charge you more or they won't insure the property at all same thing with everyone wants a nice house in the woods well woods can't be too close to your house you have to have clearance so like a burn zone so that if there were a fire you have a burn zone around your house and so that if there is a forest fire you will be able to you know save the home because there won't be trees right around your house so if you're buying a house that uh maybe it's an estate sale and nobody's lived in it for a while um, and nobody's been trimming the trees back for a long time the insurance company is going to want somebody to do that before they insure it also since there are fires, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't say, know your routes. So pretty much every community, they try to make two ways out of there in case there is a fire. So you can hightail it and not be trapped. Same thing with any home, right? So know your exit routes, know your quickest ways to safety. So I know I gave you a lot of things that sounded like warnings and I do want to warn you. I also don't want to waste your time when you're looking at properties. Uh, but the last thing is community. I am impressed by the level of community. I mean, also there are people in the mountains that want to be in the mountains because they don't want to be by anybody. Neighbors take care of each other out there. When the power goes out or there's a big storm, uh, I notice that uh, people in the mountains, they just you know make sure that everyone is okay. Everyone has what they need. I've gone plenty of times and driving down a road and I can't find the address to a property. And I stop and I'm like, hey, where's this address? And they say, uh, what's their last name? So like they know their neighbors, they don't know the address. And that always just gives me the warm and fuzzies that they, they know who's at what part of the hill and everything like that. So that's nice. So just take that into account. So if you have additional questions about living in the mountains, comment below. We love helping you out. We have a team of agents. So whichever neighborhood, whichever lifestyle you're going for, we will help you find it. So send us a text, shoot us an email, give us a call, scroll by fence. We'd love to help you out. We got your back. So reach out to us, whichever way works best for you. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell so you're notified each time we put up a new video. And other than that, have a great one.